I have no choice. My rational brain would kick in. I would get scared. We are surrounded by spiritual beings. It's changed my life fundamentally. Hello there, my name's Tim Walter. I'm a house healer and an alternative life coach. I help people enjoy greater well-being by using simple tools such as meditation, mindfulness, and dowsing. And if that sounds like the sort of thing that you might find interesting, click the thumbs up and subscribe. Recently, I had the pleasure of talking about life-saving intuition and much more with award-winning filmmaker Bill Bennett. Bill is writer, director and producer of PGS, Intuition is Your Personal Guidance System. I spoke with Bill about his life-changing intuitive experience and about so much more too, including briefly a recent guest on my channel, his friend Paul Selig. Bill is a man keen to share his life-changing experiences and wisdom to help others. Who knew, for example, that intuition could be broken down into four different types. Bill speaks in down-to-earth, very relatable terms, so there's something in this conversation for everyone. Uh, everyone who's ever taken a break from the daily cacophony and wondered, what if? We start by hearing about the intuitive incident that saved his life. You were driving one morning and you heard a voice. Can it go, would you take over that story for me and just... I <laughs> sure, Tim. Um, I, I was actually, uh, I'm a film director and I was actually making a movie in New Orleans at the time. And I had to go to uh, the airport early one morning before dawn to catch the first flight uh, back to Los Angeles. I was uh, running late. I'd slept in a little bit. I had to get the car to the rental place and I had an intersection coming up with a green light. I didn't want to stop on, in case it changed red, I didn't want to stop. So I, so I accelerated to get through on the green. As I did, I heard a voice which said, slow down. Um, it uh, confused me because I, I had never had this kind of experience before. And I ignored it and um, went once again to accelerate. And the voice came in a second time, more emphatically, slow down. I did slow down. I thought, this is just too weird. I'm, what's going on here? Uh, I began to brake, and then just as I entered the intersection, a massive truck ran a red light on a cross street, uh, hammered through the intersection, narrowly missing me. Um, and in fact, if I hadn't slowed down and then braked suddenly, that truck would have hit me and would have killed me. I got to the other side of the intersection. I pulled over. I was shaking. I was full of adrenaline because... I had very, very nearly been killed. And I thought, what just happened? And three questions came to me. What was that voice? Where did it come from? And why did it save my life? And really, those were the three questions then that um, drove me to make the film. It took 10 years to make the film. And, but I was, I was always curious as to what this voice was and where it came from. And that film took you all over the world <coughs> to interview various people of uh, wisdom and intuitive ability. Yeah, do you want to tell us a little bit about that story? Well, uh, when I um, it, it took a long time to make the film, and I prior to that I'd been pretty much making a movie once every eighteen months or so. I'd been really quite um, quite um, proficient at being able to get films made, but this one was very difficult to get made. And one of the reasons being was that, um, number one, it was a documentary, and normally I'd, I made movies. Um, it was a documentary about an esoteric subject, and that scared a lot of people. And there was no real template for it because I wanted to do it in a particular way. Um, I didn't want to do it like a BBC knowledge documentary. I wanted to, I wanted to approach it from a very personal point of view. But um, I placed one rule on myself when I decided to make the film, and that is that I would make the film intuitively. That was the one rule that I had. And I applied that rule then to everybody who worked on the film. I said, you can only work on this film if you are prepared to work intuitively. You can't make logical, rational decisions when you come to make this film. You've got to work intuitively. Um, and so what that meant is that, you know, when you go out and make any film, um, my job as a filmmaker, producer and director is to plan. You know, you, you plan and you schedule and you budget and you, and you, <laughs> you do all of these things and, and everything is logical and, and to a, a highly worked out schedule and so forth. I decided to do none of that. Um, 
I had I had a dream, um, Tim, and okay. So what happened was this: I, I was I was finding it really difficult to get this film made, and I spent years drawing up treatments and scripts and doing presentations and going to Cannes and Toronto and American Film Market and all these places where you go to, to finance films. And I'd spoken with distributors and financiers and sales agents and so forth. And everybody said, well, yeah, look, it could be a good idea, but, but there's no precedent for it. And I kept on getting the door slammed in my face. And I got to the point where I, I started to question whether or not I should actually do the film. And I remember going to bed one night um, and saying to myself very clearly, and I didn't realise this at the time, but but basically I was asking the universe. But but I was just saying to me, I just said to myself as I went to bed, I've got to make a decision in the morning. I, I've, I've got to either decide whether or not I'm going to do this movie and keep moving with it, or um, just walk away and put it down as a really interesting experiment. Anyway, I woke up in the middle of the night I woke up at a particular time, I should say, in the night. It turned out to be 4.44 in the morning I woke up. And I had I woke up out of a very clear, a very strong, strong dream in which I was told <coughs> pardon me, exactly how to do this film. I, I shouldn't wait for the big budgets that I normally have. I shouldn't wait for the big crews. I should pretty much do it on my own dime with a small crew and I just should start it immediately. Like I say, I, I, it was very, very clear, you know, this message that came through this dream. And then I looked at the uh, bedside clock and it was 4.44 and I thought, that's weird. And I picked up an iPad by my bed and I Googled, what does 4.44 mean? And up came entry after entry. But the first entry, in fact, was uh, by Doreen Virtue, who a lot of your people might know. Um, and she said that it was a very powerful angelic number telling me that right at this moment, I was surrounded by my guides, my spirit masters and my archangels. They were acknowledging that I'd done good work, but that they were encouraging me to move forward. And that if I trusted my inner wisdom and my intuition, then they would um, protect me and guide me to great success. Okay, so you got you got to understand. I've, I've woken up out of this dream with this very clear message, and then I realise it's four forty four, and then I read this about what forty four form means. And Tim, at this point in my life, I didn't believe in angels, I didn't believe in spirit guides, and I didn't believe in any of this stuff. Um, you know, I'd um, I'd come out of journalism. I had a very rational approach to things, and I thought, what do I do? What do I do? You know, do I, do I take this seriously? You know, the dream coupled with 444, coupled with what I re read about what 44 means. Essentially what I felt was that it was more, it was more than just a decision as to whether or not I should do the film and, and, and follow this, this strange kind of thing that just happened. I had a very, very strong feeling that if I did that, then my life would change that I would, you know, I, I was lying there in bed. It was winter where I was in Australia and thinking, okay, if I do this, then I'm going to have, and if I do it properly, I'm going to have to go to a place where I can't come back from. And I went to, I went to uh, sleep and I woke up in the morning and I went, yep, I'm going to do it. Um, <laughs> so what happened was I went out and I bought a camera and some sound gear and some lighting gear um and i got tickets to india because i felt that that was the best place to start a film on intuition and i just began to shoot the movie myself and then over the next three years i brought in a number of investors who came on board and we end up with a budget of over a million dollars wow right yeah. oh wow excellent oh well that that excellent there's so many for one thing, I know I was sort of smiling through a lot of that because, quite frankly, I, what I saw was a very seasoned and uh, traditional filmmaker suddenly forced to go to, to abandon all, all of his experience of making movies and how to do it yeah. properly and go, OK, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll do that then. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely right. 
movie making as a whole uh, is so driven by schedule and planning that it's really interesting that you have made the movie in this respect. How has it changed your approach? Okay, this is a big like this is big. This might take you forty five minutes to answer. How has it actually changed your life in making that decision to start the movie in that fashion? It's changed my life fundamentally. Um, fundamentally, I'm now a totally different person to the person that I was when I when I woke up that morning. Um, I I decided when I when I decided that okay I'm going to do it and I'm going to do it this way this particular way I decided that I would um, forego my need for evidence prior prior to that um, all my all my upbringing and training really had been in evidence based thinking but. I decided to I decided to forego that and go, all right, well, I'm going to keep an open mind on this. I'm going to keep an absolutely open mind. I'm not going to come in with any biases or prejudices or cynicism or anything like that. Um, I'm just going to see where this leads me. Um, when I say that I was making the film intuitively, I had no list of who I was going to go and interview. Um, I just knew that I was going to go to India and I was going to lob there and then see what happened. So, <laughs> but, you know, look, I'm, I'm not entirely crazy. I'm, I'm By this stage, uh, and this was, I guess, about four or five weeks after um, I'd had that dream, um, some people had heard that I was going to, uh, that I was actually going to proceed with the film and they'd come in as investors. So I had money, real money backing me. And I felt a certain responsibility to that, to those investors. Um, and so what I did is I, I've been to India before and I, I called up a few people that I knew in India and, you know, and, and said, can you help me find interviews? I got on the plane with my wife um, to go to India and I had nothing lined up, nothing had come through. I mean, it was terrifying, <laughs> you know, because here I am starting this movie with people actually putting in real hard, you know, their own money behind me. And I had nothing. I had nothing to do. Anyway, so, so I'm in the car, in the taxi, in the back of the taxi, um, heading from Bombay, Bombay Airport uh, into the CBD to the, to the hotel. And I get this kind of memory flash um, because I, I'd done this trip before. I'd been to India before and to Mumbai. They call it Bombay. And... I got this memory flash of a billboard by the side of the road. And I saw the billboard very, very clearly. It had um, a Bombay Yoga Institute and with the contact details. So I had my iPad with me in the back of the cab and I had international roaming on it. So I quickly Googled um, Bombay Yoga Institute and up came a website with a phone number. And so I called them from the back of the cab, you know, while I'm going into the hotel. And I said, I'm a filmmaker from Australia. Can I please come and interview the director of the Institute? It turned out the director of the Institute was one of four or five most important um, women in, in all of India. I didn't realize that at the time. Anyway, so, um, so the next day I lob in at the uh, Institute and I do the interview with this lady and she was absolutely extraordinary. An extraordinary woman gave a wonderful interview. And, um, and I mentioned about um, I mentioned about the the billboard at um, you know on the on the side of the thing you know that I remembered seeing it and and she said um, she said we don't we don't advertise on billboards we we don't have a billboard there and I said uh, but I but I remember seeing it very very clearly um, and she led me out to the front of the institute. And there was this sign above the front entrance. And it was exactly what I had seen in my, in this memory flash thing, down to the lettering, the font type, the way it was laid out, everything. Now, I'd never been to this place before, never. I'd never been to that part of Mumbai ever. Um, and then I started to realise that things were happening that I couldn't quite explain. Anyway, this lady then introduced me to... Um, a very holy man in Rishikesh on the Ganges, 
And then he introduced me then to other people. And um, I met a photographer there, Rishikesh, who was the had just come from being the official photographer for the Vatican. So he got me into the Vatican. And I, I was just led, you know, person to person. And I just followed my nose. Um, Tim, it, it was just the weirdest, weirdest thing. I never planned anything. I just allowed intuition to guide me. And um, that's, that's wonderful. Uh, so you were really, really open to the possibility of anything. That's really the nugget of that, isn't it? Yeah. So um, in a way... I put, I, no, I put no filters on them. I, put, I, I surrendered absolutely. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. And uh, in, in uh, I spoke to Paul Selig a little while ago, and one of the big takeaways, which was such a simple line that he popped out, was mm. what he does as a spirit medium. I, th- I think you've, you've interviewed him, I think, haven't you? Yeah. Um, yeah. What he does as a spirit medium is turn up. He says, what I do is I turn up, and I'm very good at turning up. And what you mm. did in that mo- making that movie was simply being, yep, here I go, I'm turning up. On, and just allowing that flow just to continue through. Fantastic. What a lesson in itself. But how, so therefore, how do you, how have you then taken that kind of learning and, and that kind of process in, into your, uh, your daily life now? You know, I mean, this was a few years ago you were doing that. Um, Tim, you can't separate it. I'm, I mean, you can't switch on and off, really. I'm, I mean, I, I have no choice. Um, it was very, very interesting because at times during the three-year process of making the film, um, I would get scared. You know, I would, my, my rational brain would kick in and I would think, what am I doing? I don't know anything about intuition. I'm a phony. I'm a fake. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, and by this stage, more money had come in. I had greater responsibility and, and I really started to question myself. And, and what I realized was that as soon as I retreated into fear and the logical part of my brain, everything stopped. And as soon as I let go and trusted and said, all right, maybe there is such a thing as divine timing. I'm an impatient person, but I'll put that, <laughs> I'll put that aside and I'll just wait. And, you know, the very, very interesting thing, Tim, is, is what I realized was this, those times when I went into fear and I stopped and everything ground to a halt, were the times when I needed to learn. Um, There were were the times when I would suddenly discover a book that I hadn't, you know, that I hadn't been aware of before. And I would sit down and read that book. And then I go, okay, I get it. So that's the next thing. That's filling the gap that I needed, you know, and and that happened time and time again. And it, it proved to be, more than just mere coincidence. It, um, what I what I got the sense of was that I was being guided by a hand that was nudging me when I needed to go forward and then holding me back when I wasn't ready to go forward, if that makes sense. And to give you an example of that, and you mentioned Paul Selig, um, towards the end of the process of filming, I had, um, by this stage, I'd, I'd, I'd been filming for over, over three years. And we'd pretty much done all of the interviews. We were very, very well advanced in editing. And I was taking an interest in the process of channeling. And I went onto Amazon and I, and I um, did a search on channeling. And up came Paul Selig's books. And in fact, it was his fourth book, I think, called The Book of Mastery. And, you know, people talk about walking through a bookstore on a book just falling off the shelf and landing right at their feet. That, that was the feeling I had with this book. You know, I, I, I bought it immediately. I read it immediately. Then I bought his three previous books, starting at I Am The Word and worked, worked the way through and read everything. And then I turned, turned to my wife, Jennifer, who's my partner, and I said, we've got to go to New York and interview this bloke, Paul Selig. Now, this is quite early in the piece, um, piece and Paul wasn't as famous as, as he is now. And... She said, but we don't have the money and we've finished filming and you're advanced in editing. And I said, well, look, we've got to find the money somehow and we've just got to go and we've got to edit and we've got to film him because I really feel that he's an important part of this film. And so we did. And Paul was in the film. He made a fantastic contribution and um, 
he's in my new fear, a film that I'm doing at the moment uh, on fear, and he's become a friend. It, it, it's lovely that you say that he, 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 his book just jumped out at you in that way. Um, I in, uh, I was making contact with a publicist and, and she sent through a whole list of her clients, 50 or so people on the page. Paul Selig was one of them. And I just leapt out. It's like, <laughs> I, this, I've got to speak to this guy. I don't know who he is. I've got to speak to this guy. Uh, story. You're a storyteller, and there's no doubt about that in talking to you. This is what you've just relayed story after story in these first few minutes. How do you... I hope I'm not boring, Tim. Yeah, you are. I mean, the time I'm asleep. I mean, you know, it's just... <laughs> I know you've been nodding off there, I can see. <laughs> Boy, this is, this is great stuff. I love it. Um, I love it. And, I, and actually, actually, really was nice for me as well, personally, as a human being. I love speaking to you as a filmmaker, because I used to make films in a very different level to you so so it's lovely to speak to a filmmaker again so but story and we'll come back and talk a little bit about your new movie that you're working on fear um uh, shortly and don't let us go without talking about that but story story structure do you did you you know there are various hollywood gurus etc that used to be really big in the 90s etc around that kind of period people like bob mckee and I can't remember the other guy's name, Tru Truby, um, who were sort of, you know, putting out the, this is the way to do it. This is the three act story structure, pull apart, follow the, you know, the, the, the hero journey, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Did you kind of, from, were you part of that process in, in, in your early days, in, should we say, in your pre-intuitive days? Um, I read all those books. Uh, I think any film, filmmaker has to. Um, I was more interested in um, Joseph Campbell, um, and in particular Hero of a Thousand Faces, of course, which has been used by Spielberg and Lucas and whatever. Um, I mean, what a story does have a certain mechanic to it. Um, th there's no doubt about that. And when I sit down and I watch television or I read a book and I become disengaged. I immediately ask myself, well, why? And then I look at it structurally. Um, and I think for any dramatist, um, really, and, and I regard, you know, non, non-fiction documentary makers as dramatists, um, any dramatist needs to understand these, but if you slavishly follow the rules, then you're gonna make a film like everybody else. Um, and that's what happened in the 90s, where we started to look at films that were just cookie cutters. You know, they were, they were just, they all followed the same formula, formulaic kind of thing. And you could, you'd go out of the movie and you could tell what book or, you know, the, the, or, or the fact that the film had been made by a committee of people. Um, you know, so I um, can't remember who it was who said there are two types of storytellers. Um, there's, there's discovery storytellers and there's architectural storytellers. And architectural storytellers are the ones that require the blueprint, require everything worked out beforehand. And, um, and then having worked it all out, you know, worked out all the structure and characters and their arcs and all, all that stuff, they then write it. Discovery storytellers are ones that go... This is an interesting idea. I wonder where it's going to lead. <laughs> and I'm, I'm a discovery storyteller. Um, I, um, you know, sometimes it requires more rewriting, you know, because you do discover uh, and you get to the end and you think, oh, crikey, well, maybe I should have done that, 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 and that now that it's gone this way. But Stephen King uh, said something once, because he's a discovery storyteller. He starts off with a what if. Um, and he said, um, if I'm sitting down and I'm writing and I don't know how it's going to end, how's the reader going to know how it's going to end? <laughs> and I thought, yes, that, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, that, that's what I love about, about uh, storytelling. I, I love the discovery aspect of it. And one of the things that, that compels me, it certainly compelled me with the intuition film, is I, I knew nothing about intuition when I started off. Um, and I had a, 
a, a really deep burning curiosity to find out what intuition was and how it worked. And then that's what that, that discovery for me is what led me forward. So, so just to put it in perspective, uh, what year was it that you had your your life saving intuitive insight uh, in comparison to when you were making your movie? You mean the the car thing? Yeah, yeah, the car thing. Um, that was um, it was about nineteen ninety seven, I think. Right. Okay. So, okay. So you did embark mm-hmm. on that movie pretty soon after that. That in that incident. No, no, no. It was ten. It was ten. Oh, it's ten um, and then it took you ten years. Ten years, yeah. Oh, that's yeah. My yeah. That's my and and a good deal of that, I must say, was spent reading, um, trying, and you know, crikey, Tim, I'm so pleased that nobody sat down and wrote me a check. You know, um, short shortly afterwards, after that, the film would not have been as good as it turned out to be with that 10 year gestation period right gotcha gotcha i see so yeah so you had to go through a development process yourself and understand a, a development within you in order to actually then be in a in a state i'll use the word energetically to actually make the movie anyway well, to have that dream for a start well exactly because one of the one of the basic things was i you know what i started of um, searching for a definition of intuition. And I couldn't find a definition that actually met the characteristics of what happened to me. Um, and then I started to realise that people were using the word intuition and, and um, instinct interchangeably. And they're not. They're two totally separate things. Instinct is totally different from intuition. And, and then I started to realise that, that intuition was kind of like this broad catch-all word that seemed to be amorphous and covered a whole bunch of different things and nobody had like kind of done the the deep dive on it and really kind of worked out what i came to believe was that there are different types of intuition okay and if you like i can go go through them very quickly yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. There's, there's, there's four types of intuition, and, and this is just stuff that I worked out just based on my reading and, and, and so forth and research. There's what I call survival intuition, which is survival of the species. Um, that's, inst- that's intuition from the body. It's a heightened sense of awareness. It, um, mother's intuition falls into it. You know, a mother has a sudden intuition that she should go upstairs and check on a child. And she goes upstairs and realizes that the child is somehow endangered and that had she not had that intuitive twig, you know, the the child would have died. Um, We see survival intuition when we're walking past a a dark alley and we just get a vibe. I don't, I don't, I shouldn't go down that alley. And turns out there's some bad people down there. You know, that's survival intuition. Second type of intuition is what's called, um, what I call cognitive intuition, which is based on expert knowledge. So that's the intuition like a CEO would use when he makes a gut decision. Um, He says, I made made it intuitively, but in fact, it's based on his expert knowledge of the circumstances. Uh, You see it with um, elite athletes. Uh, Ayrton Senna talks about, you know, driving his car before he died, (laughs) driving his car you know, where he, he wasn't in control of the car. You know, the car drove itself. And Kelly Slater talks about that when he talks about surfing. Um, so that's cognitive intuition based on what I call subsumed memory recall, where somebody goes into a subsumed memory that they didn't even realise they had based on their expert knowledge of that, whatever it is, and they bring it up instantaneously and it's there and they call it intuition, but it's based on their expert knowledge. The third type of intuition is what I call mystical intuition, which is what happened to me in the car. It's a voice that says, hey, slow down. You know, it's, it's a feeling of like a hand on a shoulder. I've, I've spoken to people who had this happen. You know, they feel a hand on the shoulder as they're about to cross the street and then a car <laughs> just whip, zips past and, ha- and they look around, there's no one there. Um, I, I've heard stories like this time and time again. It's mystical. Um, 
it's inexplicable. Science can't explain it. Um, and this is for, for me, and probably probably <laughs> Tim, knowing your work uh, as little as I do, but having having the sense of you, um, I I regard mystical intuition as the true intuition. Um, the fourth type of intuition is kind of like a mystical intuition. I call it proxy intuition, and that's where um, somebody brings intuition to you. For whatever reason, you might block your intuition or you might um, you might not believe it or whatever, but somebody comes to you or something happens um, outside of you and um, causes you to make, to make a decision. Uh, an example of this is somebody who says, uh, Tim, mate, I don't think you should get on that train going back to London this afternoon. Uh, I don't know why, I just got a bad feeling, but please don't get on that train. And you don't get on the train and the, the, you discover later the train crashes, you know. And this has happened a lot. Um, there are a lot of very um, credible accounts of people who uh, had that happen to them on the Titanic. They were prevented from going on the Titanic. 9-11 um, is full of stories like this. It's intuition that acts through somebody else. So there are the four types of intuition. And as soon as I figured out that intuition could be if you like, compartmentalized into these four categories, then a whole lot of a whole lot of it made sense to me. I, I'm somebody, even though I'm, you know, I profess to be intuitive, I do like to find order <laughs> in some form. Yeah. yeah. So do, do you still find, do you find that that gives you any conflict in your own personal, in your life? Or, or are you happy that, okay, you understand that that is you, that you've got the intuitive ability and you will follow the intuition but equally you find part of you questioning and as you said before sometimes in circumstances retreating into fear do you find that actually gives you conflict or are you happy that that is you no i'm really happy that that's me um i, I met uh, one person that i met during the making of the film is uh, judith orloff she's a um psychiatrist and one of um california's top psychiatrists and this is a lady steeped in science and she firmly believes in angels. And she said something to me, um, you know, when I think I certainly during the interview and then later we talked about it more. Um, she said, we're surrounded by angels all the time. And then, and so I thought about that and I thought, I thought, okay. Now, once again, going back to keeping an open mind. Um, let's say this is true. Let's say we do have angels surrounding us all the time and they're, they're looking at us and they're watching us. They're not judging, but they're just there. If that is true, how would that change your behavior? Now, I ask myself that question. If I knew that I had spiritual beings around me, how would, how would that change the way I spoke to people, the way I thought about people, what I did or didn't do. And Tim, that one what if has been revelatory for me. I mean, it has, it has really quite profoundly changed my life because I do believe that we are surrounded by spiritual beings. And, and if that's true, you don't want to be a dickhead. You know, really, do you? It's, it's, it's quite straightforward, isn't it? I mean, that's the bottom line. Yeah. But that, but that, that means that you're putting a judgment on your own action, whereas they don't mm. put a judgment on your action. Exactly. But they do yeah. understand what would be better for us. Mm. Well, I, I think I think they understand. You know that we're the we're human and then we are here to learn various lessons and then we make mistakes. And that's part of, part of what it is that part of our, our journey through life is making mistakes and hoping that more times than not, you learn from the mistakes. I suppose you, you, your, your summary of you don't want to be a dickhead is, is the equivalent of saying you, you, you want to be the best person that you possibly can be in that sense, which is really what the spirit, the spiritual teaching would be, isn't it? If we put a platitude in there, then that's what it would be. 
Uh, Probably. Yeah. I mean, Paul, Paul talks about this quite a bit. And, and Paul, in fact, Paul Selig, in fact, has had really quite a profound impact on my life and my thinking. He really has. I, I could completely get that. I mean, I have to say, mate, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm loving talking to you, but in all due respect, Paul Selig, um, sorry, I'm going to insult you, Bill. I'm not meaning to insult you. What I meant was Paul, Paul's presence uh, stayed with me for so long after talking with him. And I think it's partly that whole, you know, his whole, well, it's his whole being. It's, it's wonderful. Uh, Bill, I Tim, think we, Tim doesn't take... look, no, 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 no. I've got to say, mate, oh. and I'll lean forward when I say this to you. Believe me, you'll think about me after this interview. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know I will. That's what I was about to say. <laughs> no, not necessarily in, in the same way as you think about Paul Selly, but you'll think, yeah. that bloke said, referred to angels, and then in the same breath talked about dickheads. How can he do that? <laughs> a good question and when i read that in your email i thought oh bloody hell i hope he doesn't ask me that i haven't really talked about this with anybody before <laughs>